Um, yeah, so Tom and I are going to kind of uh, cover what uh, well, could be really, really dry if we do a bad job, or maybe it's interesting if we do a good job, so we'll see how it goes. Um, I'm going to provide a little bit of a high level covered for uh, all things regulatory uh, in the world of eVTOL and where things have been, where things are headed. And then Tom is going to kind of maybe take a direction of uh, some activity going on in the standards world, maybe the view of this from an applicant perspective. So uh, let me kick this off. If you'd flip to the next slide. Do I have a flipper? Here I go. I'll do that. All right. So uh, I want to show you a bit of where we've been. So classic uh, general aviation we would define as this stuff. So from business jets down to little piston airplanes and rotorcraft historically has been general aviation. Um, so we've always defined general aviation in the general context as not scheduled airlines and not military. Uh, and so kind of naturally EVTOL kind of fits into that world of 135-like operations of uh, other types of vehicles. So there's some um, synergies and some things that don't fit so well. So let's talk through some of that. So regulatorily, um, I'm going to dig a little bit into type certification of the vehicle itself. How do we certify the safety of that vehicle? I'm going to give you kind of a high level perspective. Love to talk in any level of depth you'd like to in the hallway after this. Uh, I'm going to touch on the operator or the pilot licensing aspects that we need to start considering. Continue to where this and the operational approval pieces. So this is kind of the major areas we need government approval in markets around the world. I'm going to focus most of this talk uh, in the U.S. context, so we'll be talking about U.S. type approvals, but certainly can talk about other big markets in the world if you like. So just said I'm going to talk about the U.S. market, now I'm showing you uh, the big markets in the world. So um, back in the first quarter of 2016, kind of created this chart to show you where we can certify aircraft with electric propulsion. Uh, and at that time, when we began kind of working with this community, China and Europe would allow a very small light sport with some exceptions and conversations. Um, the rest of the world was a little bit murky. We had this hope that small airplanes, up to 19 passengers, 19,000 pounds, might have a path someday. Uh, so by first quarter of 2017, this is what that world had evolved into. Um, we'd been able to kind of engage with some markets around the world, get the regulators moving in that direction. Um, and uh, at third quarter 2017, when we last had a pretty big review of this stuff, this is where the world sat. So we'll update this chart probably this quarter coming up. Um, so today, you'll see the small aircraft in the US and Europe can now be certified uh, with electric propulsion. So the rules no longer prohibit. Um, Tom's going to talk shortly about some standards that are being worked to as means of compliance to those rules for batteries and uh, motors, and the integration standards are also being worked. So very good news um, in that development. And, and what I would say is stay tuned to that center core, EASA and FAA. Um, those are going to turn green more quickly than you might think in the next year or so, uh, clearing the path for certification. So I'm going to show you why the small aircraft stuff turned green in a second. Um, the path to type certification for an aircraft, for those of you who have not been involved in this world, uh, an idea is wonderful, and then uh, an experimental prototype is also really, really fantastic. Um, but that's just the beginning, right? So that's like the 10% the work maybe, or the 5% work for some of you that are, are starting to learn about this. Once you build your compliant design and start demonstrating compliance to the FAA, um, that, that happens under, uh, you have some choices here in the US system. So part 2117B is this, um, doesn't fit somewhere else, we can, we can fit it in here as a special aircraft. That has goods and bads that I'll talk about in a second. Part 23 is normal category airplane, small airplane. Um, part 25 is transport category airplane, so the big, uh, more than 19,000 pounds or 12.5, depending on where you draw the line. And then rotorcraft are 27 and 29. Um, the engine and propeller also has to be certified in the US system. So that happens under part 33 or part 35. And once you do that, then you get your production certificate and you can build that certified design over and over and over. Uh, and as soon as you want to change something on it, you go and if it's a minor change, you can make an approval of the minor change and continue to produce. If it's a significant change, you start that loop over. Uh, so. That's the controlled system in the US. So where do we stick these vehicles? OK, part 23, I've got a slider for you here. This is a Cirrus. So the Cirrus, the fixed wing airplane, part 23, uh, has a part 33 engine and a part 35 propeller. OK, very clear. That's what the rule, the kind of thing the rules anticipated. And then if we go to the other side of that, we'll look at the Bell 429. 
I would say part 29, Rotocraft, uh, sorry, part, well, 27, 29, right? I should have picked a different example, but uh, the Bell 429 is a Rotorcraft um, with a part 33 power plant. Um, the tilt rotor, right? So the Osprey or the 609 um, is kind of right there in the middle. Uh, it's a, just about as big a combination, right? It's got Rotorcraft components, articulated blades, uh, classic Rotorcraft mounted on an airplane. So that fits almost in my mind right in the middle. And that has historically been known as a special category uh, aircraft. Um, and so where, the question I'm gonna pose to everybody, and we're having this conversation with the regulators right now, where does part 23 begin and end? Where does part 2117 begin and end? And where does part 27 begin and end, right? What are the characteristics that define that? Where do these vehicles fall depending on the characteristics they have? It's a very important conversation, and I'll show you why in a second here. Um, I would suppose to you that this little thing I drew uh, operates like an airplane a lot of the time, and not exactly like a helicopter, right? It's not articulated. Um, it's got unique vertical aspects, but its stability control is very different than a helicopter. So I would suppose it would fall somewhere like that, and I would push to make it fit into 23, and I'll tell you why in a second. So part 23 is um, a huge opportunity. So I'm gonna abbreviate for you what took about 13 years to happen in about one minute. So uh, a bunch of us in the room here had an opportunity to work with the FAA and explain why the historic rule system was really, really wonderful as far as getting safety in airplanes conceived in the 1950s and 60s, but would not fit the construct of what we all need to do in the future, right? And the FAA and other global regulators kind of agreed. So that stack of paper, that 377 regulations, became 71 objectives, safety objectives, where all the intent and safety goals of that material was retained, uh, but, to, but it was moved to a high level with the objective. It no longer talked about specific technologies. It no longer limited you to the technologies of the 1950s and 60s, and then special conditions if you had any other idea, right? So now the rules fit. But what happened to all that knowledge, right? A lot of people say that those lessons are born in blood. We can't throw them away. Well, certainly not. So those have moved to means of compliance, uh, consensus standards. A lot of those are contained uh, in, uh, in various consensus standards. Um, so to say this one other way, these white lines, those safety objectives that have historically existed, now are in the new Part 23. So instead of me telling you how to design a carburetor to um, start and stop reliably through the flight. The rule just says the power plant needs to be reliable and uh, be able to start and stop throughout the flight, right? And then to do that with a carburetor, you go look at the standard. And if to, you wanna do that with a turbine, you look at the standard. If you wanna do that with an electric motor, you look at the standard Tom is helping to create through ASTM F39 right now. So that's kind of the high level reg discussion, the certification of the vehicle discussion. I'm going to talk quickly about airmen. Um, so the U.S. population, uh, if we look at around 3.5 million folks, um, the U.S. pilot population is uh, 590,000. So if each one of those folks are 2,000 2, people, that's kind of what it looks like. Not a lot of pilots in the U.S. Um, most of those are commercial airline pilots. Uh, there's about 180,000 private pilots in the U.S. now. The lowest number we've had um, since we were growing pilots back in the 50s and 60s. So uh, continuous decline in pilots, around 10,000 a year. And it's actually accelerating about 15,000 a year the last few years. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. How do you make a pilot, right? You take a person, you add some desire, you add some studying, add some flight experience, uh, have to pass a medical, and you've got a pilot, right? Well, studying takes time. Not a lot of us like to put time into things that don't have a lot of reward. And jumping into a, four, a 1950s or 60s airplane is not as rewarding as playing video games for a lot of folks or other things we can engage in with our phones. Flying experience costs money. Same story, it's not as accessible to a lot of us. The reward is maybe not there. There are a lot of things we do in our life that have a lot of reward and we put time and effort and money into. Um, flying is falling off that spectrum. So the question becomes, if we're gonna have these vehicles and we're gonna need pilots, um, if we want to train them in a classical context and have them classically flying the airplane, that's probably not exactly the best thing to do. 
right? Back in the 1920s and 30s, they didn't say, hey, we got a lot of guys riding horse and buggies. Let's, let's transfer those horse and buggy skills into the air and make sure there's a buggy whip uh, to control this thing. No, they took the technology of the day and they, they used that to leverage that made it easy to fly the vehicle using the technology of the day. That's what we need to do. So here's the conversation on that. Um, we've had an opportunity, we first showed this at Uber Elevate uh, last spring. We've had an opportunity to kind of dig into the nine buckets of pilot training skills that classically have been taught by the FA and match technology against them. So where that green line is more than halfway across is where general consensus is that technology is um, available to, be, to do more than the human could do. And once it's all the way across, it means we're fully comfortable in automating those segments. So uh, the quick conversation would be navigation, right? If you, if you wanna put a human up against a GPS, uh, assuming we have a, a GPS signal, that's no challenge, right? Or an inertial nav. Uh, those systems instantly know where they are, and unless I've been there before, I am lost, right? Um, communication on the other side of that coin is a very human interaction today. It's not digital, right? So computers and, and automation is not so good at understanding what humans are saying on the radio. So with, with today's construct integrating into a communication, we don't believe automation is so ready. Emergency procedures, detect and avoid, these are kind of the weaker areas um, where, where certainly development is happening, but, but areas where we need the most development. And finally, I'll talk quickly about airspace, where we're all kind of having this conversation about airspace. So um, if you look at the airspace models, uh, kind of maybe a boring chart here, but class E and G are really um, uh, open opportunity for us today. So, so in these airspaces, we're, during daytime VFR, able to do visual separation. Um, instantly, most of these vehicles can fly in the class E and G airspace using visual separation uh, once they have a standard airworthiness certificate. The question becomes, at, op at, at higher capacity, how do we coordinate? Visual separation at a certain point doesn't work anymore. So what do we do? And then the other question becomes, how do we integrate these vehicles into the controlled airspace? Um, there are political real realities to operating in the controlled airspace. Uh, the air traffic controllers, the air traffic control unions don't really wanna see tremendous changes in those worlds. So what we need to do is kind of evolve over time to meet everyone's needs. Um, another thing I'll point out here is that airspace I just discussed, the uncontrolled airspace, um, I, I'm marking out all the controlled stuff in the US uh, on this chart. And um, remember that's a lot of that's the worst case because it's more of a composite top down shot. So a lot of that has space above or below. About 95 to 98% of the airspace is uncontrolled. Huge opportunities. However, uh, terrible economic models in those airspaces, right? It's not the cities. It's not where you can make a lot of revenue. So the point is you can get going. You can start to prove out operations. Uh, but to make money as soon as possible, we need to get into these spaces. So here's just a concept we're starting to tease around, um, and it has to do a lot with some of PK's conversation, and we'll build this out as a community of manufacturers here in the next several months, hopefully. Um, 5G connectivity is on its way. We believe within the next year or two, in the flight levels, you'll have cell phone connectivity, um, pretty much all the bandwidth you're gonna need. Uh, so what do we do with that? Well, imagine if we took care of all of our cyber issues and all of our hacking problems by making um, a network in the sky where we have known entities, right? So we only give somebody an IP in this range if they're a known entity, uh, and then we uh, make sure they have a certain level of cyber protection. And now we have this backbone of something we can really start to rely upon for interesting communications and, and possibilities. Um, we could call it Skynet, um, but <laughs> that doesn't turn, well, turn out well. Um, so we should probably call it something else. Uh, the, um, but the concept is here, right? So we could do trajectory, we could do 4D, 4D trajectory, um, location, we could clear vertiports, we could know our weather, flight data, landing information, maintenance information. So this backbone will be very important. And I suggest if we do this voluntarily, if we just start to coordinate in this fashion, not a government system, uh, and we prove out that it works, this could also be used in that controlled airspace, right? Once we're using it in uncontrolled, there's no reason we can't use supplementary information in controlled airspace amongst ourselves. And once we prove how well that works, I would imagine regulators around the world might say something like, oh, you, we should probably start using that too. We'd like our guys to know what you're doing and where you're going. Uh, in addition, supplementary information. Um, sounds a lot to me like how ADSB came along, the capstone kind of programs of the uh, 90s and 80s. So 
Uh, with that, I will turn it over to my friend Tom here. Okay, so um, if you remember everything Greg said, I'm just going to try to apply it a little bit here and talk about some of the considerations if we were thrust into that position where we wanted to develop one of these aircraft. It's the arrow, right? The worn off one. The worn off one. How obvious. Okay, so let's just pretend we're an applicant. Uh, we're going to go to FAA and say we want to develop this aircraft and we want to get a type certificate because we want to use it for commercial purpose. So uh, we want to do the air taxi thing. That seems to be the hot ticket these days. Um, we're going to do optionally piloted because we really want to end up without a pilot in there, but we need to start there for now. Uh, capability, we want to be able to take off vertically, we want to be able to fly in a wing, uh, distribute electric repulsion, all the things that, that we would like to have in, the, in uh, this kind of aircraft, up to four people, uh, good cruise speed, composite fuselage. So with all of those things, uh, we need to figure out uh, how we go forward. What are the requirements for all that? FAA was aware of this uh, quite some time ago, did an internal study to look at what this meant because they didn't want to get way behind knowing this really was going to turn into something. So they put the study together looking at the, the history of uh, electro propulsion uh, in particular and looked at everything from uh, automo uh, the auto industry, all the different industries that use electric propulsion, how all those things may uh, impact what the regulatory structure should look like, and look at the current regulations for what the gaps were. So off you go. You, you're the applicant. There need to be some basic decisions right up front. So as Greg already said, there's a couple of different choices you have uh, depending on your aircraft configuration. Um, if you're somewhere in between, um, Part 23 may provide some opportunities that it didn't before uh, for you to be in the airplane category. Uh, Part 27 rotorcraft category is pretty specific. The, the rules are the same as they have been for a really long time. Uh, they're very prescriptive. It would probably be pretty hard to meet everything in there if you had a set of wings on your, your uh, aircraft. The 2117B is, is the catch-all for anything that doesn't fit anywhere else. Uh, that's probably where you're going to end up, although um, FAA doesn't really want to use that category for mass production. That's not what it's really for. So you might start there, but down the road you might find uh, that there'll be another option in the future. We'll kind of have to see how that plays out. So right now, as of uh, six months ago, FAA already has some projects that they're working, both manned and unmanned, different sizes. Uh, so they're getting their feet wet, so to speak, uh, dealing with these questions of, of what to do. Uh, as was mentioned, there are several different components to the aircraft for which there are specific rules. So you have the, the airframe, you have the engine, you have a propeller uh, or a rotor system that all needs to be uh, still figured out. So for instance, if you have an electric propulsion system, if you go to the folks that deal with uh, part 33 for engines, they're used to engines, not motors. If you look at the regulatory requirements, they're still prescriptive toward either your piston or your turbine engine. So if you say, well, I'm not either, then you get into this discussion about, so what requirements do I have to meet for this particular application? And you start this dialogue uh, to figure out what that is. So ideally, in the long run, uh, we're hoping to see regulatory language that's much more like 23 is now, that's very open and allows a lot of, of that to be pushed down to the standards, and we'll talk about that in a second. So <clears throat> the, un, the manned and unmanned question is one that also uh, gets interesting because uh, really, if you're going to be optionally piloted, in terms of the aircraft, that means that the aircraft can be flown without a pilot. So all the requirements have to be met for something that, that doesn't have a pilot on board, plus all the things that you would normally expect uh, for a pilot to control. So you actually have to do twice the work. So anybody who's thinking about that needs to realize that there's going to be a lot of work involved. So there are some who might consider 
just trying to go all the way, one at, choose one or the other, or do initial model piloted and then a future model uh, that isn't, depending on, again, what uh, the level of complexity is. So where do you start? You get a hold of your local aircraft certification office. Uh, you start the dialogue with them at a very basic level. Here's my idea. Here's my uh, drawing on a napkin. They'll give you feedback as to, to uh, what the requirements would be based on what you're presenting. Uh, if you're in the unmanned space, again, if you're optionally piloted or just no pilot, the process is a little different than the traditional manned system in that they, <clears throat> what they want to see right up front is a concept of operations and what the risk mitigations are for uh, things like lost link or uh, if you uh, somehow lose control. If you don't have a pilot on board to take over, how, how do you deal with that? Also, uh, we do have already regulations for uh, what everybody calls drones, uh, the smaller things under Part 107, for which the requirements there are very, very different than once you go above that. Essentially, once you're above that, you're just into the traditional uh, aircraft certification requirements. So what are the, I mentioned some of the, the issues that you have to deal with uh, if you're unmanned. So there's the operational risk assessment. Uh, if you're flying beyond visual line of sight, uh, sea and avoid issues, uh, communication failure, lost link. Um, here's one of those little eye charts. Um, actually, it's pretty, not too hard to see. Of uh, kind of, and this is a draft, so uh, this may have changed since I got this. But it kind of gives you an idea of, of the process that you would go through to be able to uh, go to FAA and say, here's what I want to do. And then they would say, well, here's what you need to provide um, all the way through the process to, to get the type certificate at the end. What you might have to do is going to be based some degree on uh, what risk FAA thinks um, your vehicle poses in terms of its operation and its design. So you can see here, it might be a little hard to see in the, in the green, it actually shows <coughs> different class levels. So if you're way at the bottom, if you're just a model, like if you're operating under part 107, you don't have to really comply with anything in terms of the airworthiness of the aircraft. As you start to move up, uh, then there do get to be requirements and the requirements escalate. So for instance, today we have uh, part 23, general aviation aircraft, but that's not the same as if you're going <clears> to <throat> uh, develop the next airliner. It's a much higher level of uh, rigor. We talked earlier about category a little bit. So interestingly, uh, not too long ago, FAA came out with a new order uh, that had to do with uh, describing categories, the taxonomy for the categories of aircraft. And uh, lo and behold, there was this term called hybrid lift. Uh, which is a little different than what we might be used to. If you go today to uh, part one of the definitions at FAA, it says powered lift, and this says hybrid lift. So there's a definition in there. Uh, the order is actually quite uh, explicit as to categories of aircraft uh, for which, while this order is in place, it says down at the bottom that all of the FAA agencies for which this would be impacted by it uh, they can adopt this over time. Uh, so that's not a common term now. It might not be for quite some time. But it definitely has an impact because if you look at the definition, uh, heavier than air aircraft supported at vertical takeoff, landing, uh, low speed flight with rotors uh, or thrust. Somebody actually paid a lot of attention to these words. Uh, so we're not talking about helicopters necessarily. If it's rotors or thrust, and then horizontal flight by dynamic reactions of air against its wing. So that's one of these hybrid kind of things. Uh, but it's, it's standalone. There's no regulatory language that this is attached to to say, if you are this category, then you must do all of these things. So there's still this big question as to how that's going to be handled. So uh, for now, let's assume that you chose um, as your as the applicant that you wanted to go 2117B, then you'd be picking whatever was applicable from existing regulations. So for instance, uh, 
Anything that has to do with flying on the wing is gonna be part 23. If it has to do with vertical lift, it would be part 27. Part 33, propulsion. Part 61, noise. <clears throat> the risk class, if you're unmanned. Uh, and that definitely gets into the software issue, which is one of those big uh, things that hasn't really been spoken about too much that uh, is one of the huge critical aspects of all of this. And then you get into the, the means of compliance. So you come up with your, your uh, uh, list of requirements that you say, this is what we think we need to meet in order to, to move forward. And then the next question is, okay, well, how are you going to meet those requirements? So then you have to come up with uh, the means of compliance to do so. So you have to explain, okay, to meet this, we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to do this test. We're going to do this analysis, whatever it may be. Uh, you might use existing regulatory language to find that. You might use an industry consensus standard. Or you might just come up with something on your own <coughs> because you can't find anything anywhere where there's already precedent. So each one of those are gonna have different levels of uh, expectation with them. So existing regulatory language, everybody's used to it. Uh, if you meet what has been set before, it's probably gonna be pretty easy to do that. On the other end, you make up something on your own. It's unproven, nobody knows about it. That might be a bit of a challenge. So on the, on the standard side, um, I've been working quite a bit uh, through ASTM to develop some of these means of compliance to specific uh, areas where there isn't yet any uh, regulatory language uh, to show means of compliance. So uh, as an example uh, for electric propulsion, there's an effort going on right now to uh, develop these means of compliance to meet uh, part 23 requirements uh, for installation side, and then either part 33 or CSE if we're talking about uh, Europe, where they, the regulatory language is still really prescriptive, uh, but we know that there's a need to, to produce that information because applicants want to be able to go to an authority and say, I have an, uh, an electric uh, propulsion system or I have an aircraft using that, for which if we do the legwork up front as a industry, uh, and we have some consensus there, if we can take that to the authority and say, this is what we think the, <clears throat> how we could meet a requirement, the likelihood of them accepting it is much higher. <coughs> Excuse me. So these are some of the, the current activities toward uh, putting that together. So in the case, more specifically, of the electric propulsion unit, which is just the motor and what's attached to it and the controller, um, there's a fairly large group, over 50 people, stakeholders, uh, from all different uh, areas, from industry, from academia, from the authorities who participate in regular discussions with the goal of coming up with a, a standard, which then could be used as a basis document, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to then kind of feed back to the authorities to say, we think that, that if you were to use this um, as, and develop your own regulatory language that would be appropriate for it, that we'd have a match and, and we could move forward with a uh, type certificate program. So we have FAA and EASA both participating in this group. And in the background, they're kind of thinking, okay, so what should the requirements be? And <clears throat> everybody knows how long it takes to do rule change. So what they're thinking is they'll they'll come up with some special conditions to cover what those areas are. So if we look beyond the aircraft itself, we have to think about the operational aspects. <coughs> Excuse me. And some of the big ones uh, that have already been talked about here is our current environment is very human-centric. And we know that a lot of these new designs are taking new technology into uh, effect and those need to be somehow factored in to, uh, so the end result is we can actually do with the aircraft what we want to do with it. And that's gonna take some work. So it's, it's both on the regulatory side, we also have to deal with uh, the societal issues, uh, 
places in land. We heard and saw some great images from Uber about what that could look like in the future. And when it gets down to the end, <coughs> obviously there's a lot of work to do, a lot of questions still to be answered, but what are the, what are the really, the highest level things? What can we all agree on uh, should be focus areas uh, for us to, as a community, as an industry, to uh, put the effort into to solve because if we can do that, that'll trickle down and, and uh, hopefully uh, provide some good acceptance. And I think that's part, Greg, I can't remember, did you talk about Epic? Uh, no, I didn't mention it, but um, yeah, so we, we certainly have a group of folks that we call, we call GEM as a committee called the Electric Propulsion and Innovation Committee, uh, which is kind of um, a range of things from traditional aircraft going into hybrid and electric, uh, in, uh, including eVTOL, and then also uh, we're working in the increased automation side of things. So that's traditional aircraft uh, offloading what the pilot historically has done uh, onto automation, which is maybe a very different concept than what the FA and other regulators are used to. Usually we kind of crank up the requirements as we add equipment, even though we should be going the other way. Uh, and then including increased automation to final automation. So we worked that um, pretty extensively. I think this year is gonna be a big year for that group of folks and uh, we will get together at the end of this month actually. And then I think it's been brought up too that really the big question, or one of the big questions is, is, is the current certification path too burdensome for what the operations and the aircraft are gonna be for in the future? And I think we're, we're hearing that if we were to try to comply as it's written today, none of us are gonna get very far. And there, there needs to be a paradigm shift. And that's, uh, that's something that we need to be able to do as a community. Uh, and, and for which we need to have some consensus on what that means. Um, we've got some folks doing studies, which is wonderful to help feed the data in. Um, and, and that's gonna allow us to, to move forward and do what we all want to see happen and hopefully in the not too distant future. Maybe as we evolve into questions, Tom, I'll make a comment about that broader subject. So I think um, there were some really good comments about the level of safety, okay? So I think none of us are saying that we want anything uh, in any way unsafe. Safety is going to rule the day. These have to be the most safe vehicles uh, possible. Um, when we allude to ideas like the current certification standards are not uh, appropriate, um, that is a talk about the stack of paperwork. We're not talking about the real safety you get out of the work that's done, right? So if you look at what's causing accidents and fatalities, it's pilot error, the vast, vast majority, 85 to 80 to 85 percent. Uh, and then you throw maintenance issues and, and engine classic engine failure issues on top of that, and you're well past the 95th percentile. Um, and so, you know, a very small slice is about the reliability. Extremely important, and that is where these vehicles can shine, right? So you have high levels of redundancy, high levels of reliability. You're offloading some of those accidents the pilot causes by building automation. Um, certainly do not want to introduce any safety or failure issues. However, um, what we do want is to field actual safety in the hands of the public, we don't want to build piles of paperwork. So that's why some of these more innovation, innovative directions are important. We really need to think with our uh, innovation hats, not with our bureaucracy hats as we go down this path. Do we have time for questions?